Right. Well, I think uh, I think we can get started now. So um, thank you for joining us. Welcome to this webinar to mark the publication of our report into the importance of good governance for innovation. Uh, I am Patrick McDonald. I'm chair of the IOD and I'm chair of the IOD Centre for Corporate Governance. We set up the centre in 2020 as an independent, not-for-profit centre of excellence. Its purpose is to explore current issues in corporate governance, company stewardship and ESG for the benefit of the business community and wider society. Earlier this year, the Centre's advisory board decided to undertake a deep dive into one topic each year with the aim of providing new insights and fresh thinking. For the Centre's first report, we decided to focus on innovation because we feel that enabling and encouraging innovation is key to stimulating economic growth. This is an area where the UK admittedly needs to improve. Traditionally, we have been very good at generating new ideas and breakthroughs, but much less good at scaling them up and capitalizing on them. Compared to their counterparts in Europe and elsewhere, a relatively small percentage of UK companies innovate to improve their own products, services, and processes. Now, we're not the only ones who believe in the importance of innovation. Just last week, the Prime Minister gave a speech in which it was his central message. He spoke of the need to fire up the innovation engine and said that he was placing innovation at the heart of his governing agenda. Obviously, there are many factors that will influence a company's ability and willingness to innovate, access to capital, skills and support, for example. But the presence or absence of those resources does not on its own explain why some companies innovate and others do not. In this inquiry, we have tested out the proposition that the way in which a company is governed must have some impact on its ability to innovate. The report we are publishing today sets out the main findings. In a minute, I'll hand over to Chris Hodge, Senior Advisor to the Centre, to take us through those findings and what happens next. After that, we'll have a panel discussion. This will be moderated by Roger Barker, the IOD Centre, or oh, sorry, Director, not the Centre, the Director of Policy and Governance. Joining Roger on the panel are Jason Danziger. He's the Managing Director of HANA Group UK. There he is, waving. Jason is an active IOD member and the proud winner of an IOD Director of the Year Award in 2021. Then we have Stilpon Nestor, Senior Advisor at Moro Sidali and a member of our advisory board. And Megan Pantelides, Executive Director of Research at Board Intelligence. All the panelists have already contributed generously to the inquiry. Stilpon and his colleagues at Moro Sidali genius, generously funded some of the research. Megan and her colleagues at Board Intelligence carried out many of the interviews, and Jason was one of those people who kindly gave their team time to be interviewed and to share their experiences. There will be an opportunity to ask questions. We welcome questions about the discussion. Please write your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom, uh, rather than raising your hand. We will keep a close eye on the Q&A box and make sure we pick up your comments. After the panel, I will wrap things up with a few closing observations, and we'll aim to finish promptly at 4 p.m. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Chris to present the main findings. Over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Patrick said, I'm going to run through the main findings in the report and say a little bit about what we plan to do next. Uh, the first slide we'll turn to now, if that's right, Helen, we'll just briefly set out as background what we've we've been doing, how we've gone around carrying out this, this review. I won't go through any of that, but I, I do dare to give me an opportunity to say a few thank yous. As Patrick's already said, our, all of our panelists have contributed greatly and Mauro Sadali and Board Intelligence have been our partners throughout the inquiry. So I'll add my thanks to his, uh, to our three panelists. I'd also like to thank all of the other interviewees and everyone else we've spoken to during the course of the inquiry. Having a quick look at the list of people who've joined us, I can see a number of you are, are here today. So thanks very much for your input and particular thanks to the two IOD expert advisory groups for their ongoing support throughout the, the inquiry. And last but definitely not least, thanks to the 700 plus IOD members who took part in the survey that's mentioned there. It was a fantastic response and I'm told it's one of the highest numbers of respondents that the IOD has ever had, uh, which is a great encouragement in terms of thinking that this is seen and recognised by IOD members as an important topic. Uh, so with that, we'll go on to the, the findings. Um, 
which uh, Helen has beaten me to it there. But I was going to say before we, we I start going through those, oh, that's all right. Stay with, stay where you are, Helen. Please, apologies. Um, before we start going through, there's just a, a, a few words on the scope of what we were looking at, uh, because as many of you will know, when you talk about in, in innovation, there are many different interpretations of what that means and so on. First thing is to say is that we are looking at all types of innovation. There is the innovation that leads to the development of products, services, or processes that are completely new to the market, which is referred to in the report as breakthrough innovation. And there will be a relatively small number of companies involved in breakthrough innovation. Much more commonly, companies will be looking to innovate in ways that are new to them, but not necessarily new to the market. And that we've called incremental innovation. How we are interested in both of those in the report, because both of them are important to, to growth indeed. Government research indicates that the diffusion of innovation, as much as the breakthrough innovation, is a significant contributor to GDP. We're also looking at all at companies of all sizes and sectors, not just either large listed companies or small startups who are carrying out that breakthrough innovation. So obviously there are going to be differences as well as similarities. And one of the things we found is that the nature of the relationship between governance and innovation can vary depending on a company's size and the stage it's reached in its life cycle. Uh, you know, generalizing greatly for some startups and SMEs, the absence of governments, governance or formal governance of some sort may sometimes be a barrier. While for larger and more established companies, the problem may be that governance has become much too focused on compliance and risk avoidance and not enough on, on supporting the strategy. So despite those differences, we have identified these characteristics that you can see on the, the slide, which appear to be common to all successfully innovative companies. Um, and then on the next slide, which I'll get to in a minute, we identified some of the governance factors that underpin those. You may have been looking at this list while I've been talking and think to yourself, well, this is all just common sense. And I wouldn't disagree with you, but I think what I would say is that it may be common sense, but what we've heard is it's not commonly applied. So um, that's why we thought it was worth highlighting these in the report and, and in this presentation today. I'll run through them, them briefly uh, and the reasons why we've identified them. The first is if the board doesn't appreciate the potential contribution that innovation can make and understand how it's relevant to the company's business model, then innovation is much less likely to be seen to be an integral part of the strategy, much less likely to be given priority when the board takes decisions about resource allocation, uh, and, and so on. On the second, the, for companies uh, as opposed to what you might call the research base, which can do more speculative innovation, for companies, it, there needs to be some understanding that it's a means to an end. Uh, I'm being asked if the slides are moving. Only when they're only meant to be moving when I ask them to move. If you're getting a vibration, then there may be something wrong with your, your reception. Apologies for that. Um, anyway, so as I said, the, the number two is that innovation should be seen as a means to an end. Uh, and again, this is a message that's come through a lot. Technologies and ideas are invaluable inputs, but it's the outcomes that determine whether the innovation is successful. And companies need to have a clear idea of what the broad objective is that they're attempting to achieve and how they're going to be able to measure whether they're achieving that. The third point there, integra integrating innovation, this is crucial to achieving the desired objective and outcomes. Uh, but it's the, it's the example of these characteristics where it's probably most variety between companies because the right approach may depend on the type of innovation that's involved. The incremental innovations that I was talking about can potentially originate anywhere in the company. And I think that's something Jason will give some examples of when, when he speaks as part of the panel. Uh, by contrast, where you're looking for so-called breakthrough innovation, there can often be a case for ring fencing those activities in some way to ensure that adequate resource and attention is played, paid to them. Whichever approach you take, at a certain point, companies need to move the innovation from development to delivery. And from that point, on, point onwards, all parts of the company potentially have a contribution to, to make. And that's where the integration perhaps is the most important. Um, and then finally, we, we heard consistently that having a conducive culture was probably the single most important factor in successful innovation. And in turn, if the culture is in place, then the company is much more likely to acquire the first three characteristics that I've identified there. So if those are the, the characteristics, what are the governance factors that we've identified as, as underpinning them? 
If we can move to the next slide now, please, Eleanor. It was meant to move at that point. Um, I'll run through these very quickly. The, the panel will touch on them in more depth, or at least on some of them, I'm sure, and, and there will be an opportunity to pick them up in the Q&A as well. So just um, going through them quickly. Uh, I think we started with the purpose of values. One of the interviewees we spoke to described this as being the base block of innovation. A company's purpose can provide the direction and enable the board to identify the objectives that innovations intended to achieve, while the values describe how they're to be achieved and are an important part of the, of the culture. The composition and the balance of the board and the expertise and mindset of individual board members is clearly an important factor. Uh, and there was a number of points that we've been highlighting the report around that. But first is that there seems to be some evidence of a correlation, at least, between diversity in the broadest sense of the word and innovation on the board. And a particular issue that came up quite regularly in the interviews was the importance of having people on the board with an entrepreneurial background and creative mindset to balance those who were seen as being more risk averse. Uh, you, you need that balance. And it may be that for some of the smaller startup companies, it's the it's the cautionary uh, members of the board, if that's the right term, that are lacking. Whereas for larger companies, what we, we often heard is that uh, perhaps as a result of the fact that the cumulative burden of regulation being board spend a, a large part of their time dealing with compliance and so on, that that informs the decision to want who to appoint and that there is a, a tilt towards having people who are more risk averse rather than the, the creative and entrepreneurial board members. Uh, it's also important that both at the board level and below, there is a clear allocation of responsibility. Um, and no, we, we were told that the lead responsibility needs to be sufficiently senior in the company that it's visible to the board and is able to provide leadership to, to the organization as a whole. It, if it's too far down, it, it's not able to do either of those things. And so obviously the CEO has a critical role as being either the potential champion or enemy of innovation. And nearly half of the IOD members who responded to the survey said that the CEO has that lead responsibility in their companies. Frequency and nature of board discussion. Again, this is, this is fairly self-evident. Probably it's important to make space on the board's agenda to discuss innovation, uh, as difficult as that may sometimes be. Encouragingly, one third of the IOD members who responded to the survey said they discussed it at every board meeting, which is, which is great. More disappointingly, 20% of them only discuss innovation once a year or even less. And so that's um, for those 20%, this is sort of an easy win, I think, there compared to some of these other issues we're talking about. Um, in fact, information boards are clearly heavily reliant on the quality of the information they have access to when both developing their strategy and measuring performance. And one thing that we, we concluded is that the typical financial and operational metrics used by companies are not always the right ones for assessing innovative activities, which typically may have a longer delivery time, and that there's a need to move to having more of a balanced scorecard in the way that boards think about this and in the, in the information that they ask to receive. And there's a similar point that came up, skipping to the last point there, in relation to rewards and incentives, specifically in relation to uh, executive remuneration, where previous research by Nesta found that uh, metrics that were, as they considered, discouraged innovation outweighed those that enhanced or promoted innovation by a ratio of three to one. Uh, so there's a particular issue there on executive remuneration. But more generally, this is an important consideration for the whole of, of the workforce. The company should be reviewing how they use performance assessments, rewards and recognition systems to encourage the generation of, of new ideas. Finally, here, organisational structure. Uh, rather like what I was saying on, on integration, this clearly has to be designed to suit each individual company and different considerations are going to apply depending on the nature of your business and the nature of the innovation involved. But one recurring theme that came through in, in all of the discussions was the importance of internal collaboration and cross-working. And again, I think that's closely linked to the point about culture that I was talking about on the previous slide. Uh, I'll stop it there in terms of the the main things I wanted to talk about, the panel, I'm sure, as I said, we'll get into some of these issues shortly. But just to briefly touch on some of the other issues that we cover in the report. Um, the main focus has been on how companies can govern themselves in a manner that supports innovation. But the report also touches on some of the other elements of what we refer to as the governance framework that impact on companies' ability to innovate. 
and in particular those are collaboration and partnering ownership and policy public policy and regulation so if we could move to the next slide please Helena. thank you um i'm pleased that i remembered all three of them so uh the, the, the collaboration and partnering came through as a recurring stream throughout the inquiry and clearly it's always been an important source of innovation whether that says company two companies collaborating or a company in the research base uh, but it seems to be becoming even more important from what we heard and we're seeing the growth of more extensive ecosystems or networks that are also being used to develop innovation uh, and obviously the potential benefits are clear it brings together different skills and resources that individual parties may lack it can reduce cost barriers by spreading them throughout the participants and it encourages the sharing of learning which in turn potentially accelerates further innovation we, we didn't get into this in any depth in the report but just as the governance of individual companies impacts on their innovative capability so it, it seems to follow that the governance arrangements that are govern how networks and partnerships work can either support or impede their effectiveness as well the impact of a company's ownership is is also uh, an important influence uh, when it comes to affecting the attitudes and behavior of the board especially in in private companies where the owners may frequently sit or be represented on on the board um, companies ideally and to the extent that they have the ability to just determine who owns them should aim to ensure that wherever possible there is a alignment of interest between their ambitions and their time horizons with those of their existing and potential owners and a fit between their their respective cultures and values however we heard during the course of the inquiry that this alignment is not always easy to achieve and in particular it's seen as an issue for listed companies and for small innovative companies wishing to attract the patient capital they require in order to grow finally the actions of policymakers and regulators as, as all of you will know impact on, on innovation in multiple different ways in this report we've mainly focused on regulation that has the potential to facilitate facilitate or create barriers to innovation uh, and the view of many people we spoke to was that the impact on innovation is not adequately considered when designing new regulation and new policies and, and uh, Patrick alluded to the, the Prime Minister's speech last week he's mentioned there that his ambition to create the most pro-innovation regulatory environment in the world so hopefully that means that this message about the need to, to put that at the you know, much more centrally when considering regulation is, is, is being taken on board and we look forward to seeing that that changing in the future that covers the contents of the report uh, if we can move to the last slide please uh, thank you Helena. Um, as you can see the the next step here with the, the, this report sets out the findings what it doesn't do is get into any detail about how you, you as companies might apply the findings and that's the next step in this in this project we will be developing guidance for directors to help them think through how to apply this to your company we're still at an early stage of thinking what that will be we you know we have the challenge of trying to find something that is potentially relevant to companies of all of all sizes and sectors so we'll we'll be sharing more details of the format and the timing in due course in the course of the inquiry we've also had many interesting examples of how companies have designed their governance arrangements in order to support their innovation effort so as well as guidance we're planning to issue a set of case studies going into a bit more detail about how individual companies address address the point which again may be some give some useful prompts for, for other boards the final is final thing i want to say is a, is a request for your help we've learned a huge amount from the people we've engaged with so far in the inquiry but we know there are many many more good ideas and examples out there so if anybody listening to this or watching the recording would like to get in touch to highlight possible case studies or if you have any suggestions for things to cover in the guidance please drop me a line at that uh, mysteriously anonymized email address there and it would be great to hear from you so i will finish there and hand over to roger and the panel thank you very much everyone. thank you very much chris and at this stage i'm delighted to welcome um to the stage um our panelists um still upon nestor megan pantalides um, and jason danziger um, and i'm going to invite each of them to present their kind of initial remarks and observations on this report and, and on the topic. Um, could I also invite you once again, um, if you have any questions, please insert them in the Q&A 
box um, within Zoom and we will come to them afterwards. But still, Pon, um, would you like to make your initial remarks? Thank you very much, um, Roger. And um, thanks to the IOD for this opportunity to support this um, superb initiative and the, the inquiry and the report that came from it, um, uh, which I find um, an excellent piece of work. So thanks to Chris and the team that heard it. Um, and uh, it is excellent because it maps all the issues, which are very complex. Um, and it shows um, clearly, in my mind at least, that there are no risks. Um, different companies in different stages of their development will need different solutions, governance solutions that facilitate innovation. Um, for those of you who do not know who Morris Odali is, we are a, a, a global governance consultant, US, APAC, Australia, and, and, and here in Europe. Um, and uh, we focus basically on governance services throughout spectrum, the interface of, of companies with markets to board services and internal governance. Um, now, I will speak to you as a, as a consultant, in a sense, um, but having seen a number of companies in very different sectors and, and in very different stages of maturity. Um, and I think that the best way to pack <laughs> what I want to say is to identify a few tension points that actually expand on the narrative of the study um, of, the, of the report that is uh, just um, presented. Um, and the first tension point, uh, I would say, is the too little versus too much um, governance. And at some point in the report, it is said that, um, of course, this is very schematic and everything, but small companies often have too little governance. Um, large companies often have too much governance um, uh, as regards, and this has um, creates problems as regards innovation. And I, I would agree with that. Um, for example, on too little governance these days, we all read the papers, FTX is a great example of too little governance. Um, um, actually, no governance, apparently, in, that, in this particular um, institution. And, 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 but the problem behind that is that very often, innovative companies mature at a, at a very, very rapid rate, mature very rapid. Um, so it is very difficult to adjust sometimes your governance environment to the needs of the company. Of course, when you're a small little startup, you don't have boards and committees and <laughs> you have a team of people that work together. But when within a year and a half, you become an organization that manages apparently more than 50 billion of client money and you have nothing in place, then there's something wrong. So I, I think the first, um, um, the, the first suggestion from my side to uh, innovative organization, especially in the startup mode, which are focused on innovation, uh, is keep a very tight watching brief on whether your governance matches the level of maturity that you have, because you can mature very, very rapidly. And then there's the too much of it. And I've worked with, in my work with many banks, uh, for example, many large banking groups that are striving now to create this culture of innovation and, and of course, compete with, with the challengers and fintechs and so on and so forth. Um, and, and of course, these are organizations where um, risk management and control is part of your DNA. Um, um, so what I've seen very often is some sort of a subsidiarization of, uh, of the 
the in innovative uh, part of the bank um, into a separate company with a separate board, and I will come to this. Um, and, and, and that kind of allows to, uh, brings me to my second point, which is integration versus segregation. Um, what I describe right now is segregation, is when you have, um, you, when your need is for a very different culture in a very broad, big organization, um, you want to preserve this microculture, you want to, to develop it and preserve it. Um, and you want to protect it, if you want, many times for controls um, uh, or interventions that have not been designed. You need to be, again, very careful in tailoring the control environment and tailoring the incentives around it. And that's not always very easy in a, in a big organization. And, and that's an, an important bit. On the integration side, um, we, we um, even in organizations that, that do not see innovation partly or wholly as, as their main focus, um, they, you, would, you would very often uh, see um, uh, structures in order to, to encourage innovation that uh, allow for things to bubble up from the front line. Uh, and, and for this, you need some institutions that might be outside your normal sort of com command and control structure that you would have as a large company. Uh, so you, you create some sort of alternative governance venues that, that are, are, are or, or, or fora uh, that are kind of um, not the same as the one, the, the system of executive committees, for example, or other that, that you have in, Great. in, in, in normal. Um, uh, one more point. Roger. Okay. Uh, and, and this has to do with boards. Uh, and here I think w w there's also kind of a tension in what the board does. Um, in, in, in the best practice governance that we all know, like the UK combined code, the board sets objectives and expects outcomes. And the report very clearly says that, and that's very right. Nevertheless, in organizations that prime innovation, Sometimes things are more gray um, because the top board will send up, set objectives in a very general way. Um, but uh, the way that it essentially encourages innovations in some parts of the house uh, is, is mostly by, by, by leveraging two key functions that it that, that it has as a board. Capital allocation and risk appetite. It does not get too much on the nitty gritty of it. Um, I, I think uh, my very, very last point has to do with ownership, which um, is of course kind of an elephant in the room because um, you know, in the report, we don't talk much about it, but we all understand that uh, ownership and control patterns in, in, in innovative companies is, is often very different from, from, from those that are in, in more traditional sectors yes. um, of the economy. And of course, the listing rules have changed, uh, and, and, and this has been partly recognized. One more thing here. Family business. Family businesses are, are, are interesting because they're based on loyalty, they're very long-termist, um, um, and, and they're considered very conservative. Nevertheless, I have seen very fam many family businesses being very innovative. Why? Because they, in the context of succession planning, of general succession planning, they take uh, one of the sons of the, of the family and and give them a brief of innovation. And that's a way of this person to prove their worth to the family. So we have seen 
wonderful things come out there. I'll stop here yeah. and I'll be very happy to participate in the, in the discussion. Thank you very much, Stilpon. Um, Megan, let, let me turn to you. What, what are your initial remarks? Um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Roger. Um, so just uh, for a bit of context, um, Board Intelligence, for those who don't know us, is a software company, UK based. We've got about 600 clients ranging from Fortune 500 financial services firms through to small charities. And we focus on board and management reporting, so helping organisations to use board and management reporting as a more effective driver of performance and and better governance. So uh, when we heard about the work that the, the, the team were planning to do on this, um, we jumped at the chance to help. Um, and I suppose a couple of reasons for that. One is always welcome an opportunity to explore the role and the impact of governance and to find ways that we can help organizations to get more value from it. Um, and I think also secondly, to try and find ways that we could help our clients as I, as I say they kind of represent a huge spectrum of organizations for some innovation is about survival others it's about pace and momentum and keeping up others it's about making the world a fairer or safer place i think there's something that they could potentially all learn um from from this exercise and i think thirdly rather selfishly for a small business for a technology business we're built on innovation our, our future is dependent on innovation so i wondered what we might be able to learn that would help us um Keep our edge, I guess, as we as we grow. Try and work out what we need to watch out for as 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 we get as we get bigger and more complex and start to be impacted by more of the governance arrangements that some of our clients are, are impacted by. So, um, as as uh, Chris Chris mentioned earlier, we went out and we spoke to a, a number of our clients, both exec and director level, and got their experiences. And I suppose the uh, the encouraging thing from all of that is that across all of those conversations, I think we did. Deliver on all of those goals, but I think there are a few things that so many of them have been picked up in the report. Oh, Megan, I think we've just lost you there. I think Chris is opening remarks. So just oh. Back, hopefully. Uh, the, my, yeah, we can hear you. No, so, sorry, Megan, we just lost, lost you for a few seconds then. Oh, sorry. Um, so yes, I just wanted to, to, to dig into the role of the, the board uh, in a little bit more detail. I guess um, it's quite a big one to start with, so I'll try and keep it short. But I think one of the things I was surprised by in the interviews that we conducted was how few boards and how few um, executives were confident that their board was kind of ha had that common understanding of what innovation meant and what it meant to be organised organization and what they thought it might handle but I think that really sets the tone and, and I think it makes things like capital allocation and risk appetite as, as still fun um, highlighted choosing the right metrics working out when and how to talk about it a, a lot easier if you're if you're clear and consistent within within the board um, around around the role that you think innovation is going to play and therefore where you put it in the pecking order of things that you have to talk about and I think the the next kind of step in terms of the board the board's role therefore then is around culture and how they how they build and reinforce that focus through board meetings through the asks they make of, of management in terms of reporting and I think the overriding message from the people that I spoke to was that um, boards need to become more tolerant of risk they need to be more curious they need to get closer to the customer problem um, that the organization exists to solve. And, and crucially, they need to give people permission to try, to, to test, to fail, to learn and try again. And I, and I think there's a, I felt there was a bit of a frustration from a lot of executives that um, I spoke to that that, that wasn't being um, encouraged by their boards or the boards kind of were, weren't approaching the conversation about innovation with that, with that um, in mind. Um, and I think, yeah, we find this with, with lots of the boards that we, we work with. Creating time and space to have those big picture conversations is so difficult in the busyness of, of the day-to-day, -day, but it is absolutely vital in, in setting the tone and helping to reinforce that culture. Um, I think the next um, the next thing I wanted to just tap, tap into then was around measurement, the sort of time old problem. How do you measure something that is so unmeasurable? Um, and I think the consensus through the interview, certainly, and I, and I think this is something that the, um, the IOD team would um, would agree with, is that 
traditional pounds and pence metrics are not the best way to measure innovation activity. In fact, they're likely to, to, um, to inhibit it to, to an extent. And, it, and it's really important that organizations um, find the right non-financial measures to complement the financial ones, but also that they break the innovation opportunity down into a series of milestones or indicators that, indi that, that show that you're making progress in testing the hypotheses that the, the innovation activity is, 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 is trying to, to, to answer. Um, yeah, it, I guess we exist as a business because finding the right metrics and finding the right ways to to break these big uh, big topics down is quite a challenge. But, but I, I think it can be done, and we had lots of good examples as to how organisations were doing that. Um, and then finally, because a lot of the conversations that we had were focused on those executives and directors working in larger, more established companies, I just wanted to share a little bit in, in terms of what we learned about what large companies were doing. I think you you, you would be you would be forgiven for assuming that large companies struggle to innovate compared with smaller, more um, entrepreneurial organizations. And I think one of the main reasons for that is that there is so much distance between those at the top, the decision makers, the people who allocate capital, determine risk appetite, um, uh, and, and the customer and the problem um, that the business exists to solve. But what we did see and what we did hear about were um, large organizations using governance and kind of being being creative within the guardrails that the, the governance um, arrangements require them to to create time and space for innovation. And I think we've, we've touched on a few of those things already around ring fencing, um, multifunctional teams, creating forums for sharing knowledge and committees and so on. Um, but there's also a lot that they can do because they're large that other organizations can't do. And I, I think this is one of the things that we saw um, those uh, those execs and directors who were kind of proudest of their innovation record. Um, tended to focus on um, and, and, and thought were a factor in their success. So you know, deep pools of capital, large international multifunctional pools of talent and expertise. You know, one, one person I spoke to in a large bank talked about how they'd instituted a forum where they brought their top 30 senior leaders together just to, just to talk and kick, you know, pick apart problems and think about how they could solve this customer problem over here in, in the way they were solving this customer problem over there and just sort of joining those those um, those minds together, I think was super powerful. So yeah, we learned a lot through these conversations. I think um, I'm, I'm glad that this com this inquiry has started this conversation because there's so much that can be done um, to help organizations innovate more successfully. It feels like we've got a lot of the right ingredients there and, and, and you know, when approached in the right way, the board can be an absolutely essential enabler of this activity and governance can more generally I think we just need to help organizations to un unlock that um, and yeah really happy to have been a part of it. Thank you Megan. Um, let me now just turn to to Jason. Um, I wonder what your reflections were on this study. Thank you Roger. Fabulous to be here. I'm the managing director of HANA Group. To give you a snapshot of our group we have just over 200 locations in the UK where our chefs make Asian food and sushi in front of customers um, in retail environments, bringing the theatre to the food hall and fundamentally changing the way we shop. We work with Marks and Spencer's, Sainsbury's, Dunn's, Whole Food and others. Um, I'm just delighted to be here today because the Institute of Directors have been um, truly, truly inspirational throughout my career. The many fabulous events like today, the courses they run, that incredible resource that they have, has enabled me to strike that balance of entrepreneurial maverick uh, with real structure and process to truly achieve success. Uh, now, the framework in terms of targeting innovation to consumers, governance innovation may look like they're opposing ends of the scale, but they're in fact really symbiotically linked. The innovation without direction or some sort of structure is just chaos and unlikely to hit those consumer uh, kind of matching needs. And as Chris pointed out at the beginning, it always does start with vision, mission, values, and purpose. Um, and that helps facilitate not only the direction, but facilitates that sharing of that journey with your team and making sure that everybody is involved um, and a drive for innovation and positive change. And it's also a fabulous checklist. So when you're in a really fast moving company where there's a lot of change, a lot of pace, to be able to have those four pillars to check that every innovation that comes through hits that. So therefore, it's relevant to your values. It's relevant to your company. It's relevant to your customer. It is so, so, so key. Uh, we call that Kaizen, the continuous improvement. 
Um, and in the report that the IOD has published, um, uh, you know, is a really great arrow for your strategic bow. It's so well written, it's so clear, um, and really will facilitate um, that innovation. Now, you're already here, so you're already in front of the queue, and you're already winners, um, because you're absolutely in front of the pack in terms of this. Uh, but what I can say to you is that the contents and, and when you actually get into the detail, it's so much more rich and informing that we can never bring alive in this short introduction. Now, we talk about the culture of innovation. Well, your most important asset, the most important asset of most companies is your people because they're close to the business and they're close to your customers. So listening to them and involving them is so key. Companies spend thousands of pounds on market research when ultimately your teams on the front page who are talking to customers know that already if you can capture it. And with the technology we have to hand, such as these Zooms and calls, uh, we use a lot of WhatsApp groups, it's very easy to uh, be able to pick that up and to talk to um, your teams, actually work out what the customer wants, which makes that innovation so much clearer. It's also worth noting that sustainability plays a big part in that innovation. We find that every time we do something on sustainability, our teams feel good, um, our customers love it, um, our investors love it, our share price goes up, it keeps the investors smiling. So it is absolute a win-win cost for everybody, whilst obviously being really good for the planet and ensuring we give it in a good place for the next generation. Now, the, we, we talk a little bit about anti-fragility. Now, uh, there's several stages when the first pandemic hit and was really, really tough. You know, we were in shock and awe, and then we worked into what was called flexibility and we adapted and adaptability. Then we moved to resilience, which was, um, you know, let's cope with it and let's move it. But resilience only gets you to a certain point. Now we start talking about anti-fragility, which is actually how you can take the many, many challenges that we have in business and use them to your advantage to move forwards. Now, uh, by the way, the, the IOD run a fantastic course on um, uh, risk analysis, um, which is another one that, that we did. And we run our risk analysis you know, every quarter, looking at what the challenges are for business. Now, in fairness, in this environment, you could probably do it weekly and have new stuff to throw in there. Um, but to, we take those risks with a senior team and a wider team, we'll sit down and we'll have breakfast away from the boardroom, away from those board meetings, so that we have luxury time where we can actually look at those risks and then talk about you know, how we can move them forward. Now, I'll give a few examples now just to bring it alive. Uh, but, you know, the interest rates have gone sky high. So we just took our working capital, put it in a, in a deposit account uh, so we can get a little bit back. It seems so obvious, but it's amazing how, you know, just wasn't thought about. You know, our consumers are under a spending challenge. So therefore, we help them with premium meal deals, you know, and trying to create that everyday affordable luxury. And then we work out that consumers are trading down. So again, we try to position ourselves to be the company that they trade down to uh, with meal replacement, dining and so forth. And then with goods going crazy in price and logistics, everything else. So then we look to kind of menu engineering. What can we do that's different? How can we create a different product? How can we bring in something that consumers want? I mean, vegan, vegetarian, some sort of cheaper items, but actually hits what the consumer wants. So you get a, a, a double win. Um, World Cup, people staying at home. So we created football boxes and delivery boxes to send to the home so they could watch it. Um, you know, high petrol costs, delays. So we ask all our area managers to sit at home, sit on their sofa, not to go out in their car, not to go and visit. And then we have a number of technology that we can use to work out if people have turned up. We have uh, a system called Ubic, which takes pictures of our showcases that so we can see that they're actually looking good. And we've got uh, analysis of software to ensure they're doing their production. So we can do a lot by not moving around, which is good for the environment, but it's also great for people's lifestyle as well. So we've looked at lots and lots of challenges within the business and work out what we can do. Shipping delays, we ended up increasing our floor stocks of goods. That meant that actually, the prices are going up so quickly, we're offsetting some of those prices and ensuring that we've got stability for a while. So I've given a few examples, but there are just so many more in terms of taking those pieces. Um, you know, whatever tomorrow's disaster is going to be, and we know and we're going to expect many, we're using that anti-fragility approach and this innovation approach that the EID are talking about today to not just adapt, but absolutely thrive and make sure that we're stronger, look after our people and create that magic. That's it for me. Thank you, Roger. Well, thank you very much, Jason. Um, let's now turn to some of the questions uh, that you, you put in the Q&A box, and thank you, thank you for putting those. And the first one I'd like to address actually comes from Adam, um, who asks, would you be able to provide examples of the executive metrics negatively impacting um, innovation? And Patrick, I'd like to bring you in here because, I mean, if you think about the sort of performance metrics, which typically are created for executives and to which their, their remuneration is, for example, often tied, it's, it's often things like earnings per share growth or total shareholder return growth. I mean, 
do you think those type of performance metrics are, are encouraging or, or discouraging an innovative approach in the business? So I think a couple of points there, um, Roger. I think it's a really good question. Um, I think the, the first thing is it's about time scale. You know, investing in innovation today may, may impact your earnings per share today. The idea of doing it, of course, is to improve your earnings per share in the future. So you need to look ahead. The other thing is you can create metrics that focus specifically on innovation. I mean, famously, 3M, the American company, the, the company behind Post-it Notes, uh, certainly used to have a metric that said that something like 25% of all their uh, sales should come from products that were had been innovated in the last three years, some, something along those lines. So you can create metrics to, to actually track and reward and incentivize um, the management team on innovation specifically. Thank you. Um, another question that we have here, I think is a very interesting one from, from Sophia, um, who says that she's, she is essentially contrasting uh, the kind of innovative approach of the founders of a company um, with the approach that perhaps board members bring. I, I assume she's referring to perhaps board members that, that come into the company at, at a later stage and perhaps are, you know, focusing on you know, some of the things that Chris was talking about, the more um, risk averse issues, compliance um, and, and, and so on. And she asks, you know, how can we early on reconcile those two approaches so that the the company can avoid, and the light has just gone here in my room, so that we, we can avoid that, what, what, what Chris was talking about, which is, and what Patrick was talking about, which is where essentially, um, you know, your growth outruns your governance. So, Stilpon, I wonder if you have any thoughts about how you can get get hold of that at an early stage. Sure, it's a very, very good um, question, I think, and, and it's exactly the subject that I tried to sort of bring to life a little bit. Um, that you need to change with the level of maturity. Itself. So uh, I, I think in the beginning, you just don't have a board. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of people that are together and they're developing the idea and, and eventually the prototypes and the products in, in, in a startup. Um, usually a, the playbook would be that the people that sit then on your board are mostly people with a lot of skin in the game, A, and two, people like VCs, like, like the venture capital, that actually has seen a, a lot of um, growth situations such as yours. Um, and so they, they, they are patient and they're your advisors. So in the beginning, your board has more of an advisory um, rather than a control function. Now, the more you, you get like an FTX money from the outside, the more you need controls. And that's the watching brief I was talking about, where you, you bring in people who are capable of overseeing um, a system of controls. Um, um, so I, I think that's how you reconcile it. You reconcile it by keeping very a very focused watching brief on your level of maturity um, thank 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 you still Paul. um Megan, I wonder if you, if you might be able to address a question which has come from sue um she's asking how would you differentiate between strategy um and innovation i mean we we do know from board evaluations that uh, you know, boards often struggle to find time actually to address either of the of these topics, you know, especially if they get very focused on on compliance and conformance type activities. But would, would you distinguish be, between discussions around innovation and discussions around strategy? Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily. I think as, as Chris um, uh, described earlier in, in the session, that, you know, innovation is a means to an end. It's not it's not the end. Right, so I, I think it has to be considered in the mix of things that you, you activities you might you might um, engage in to deliver to, to deliver whatever your strategy is. But I think the it does it does speak to a, a, a to an issue that many boards face, as you say, around finding time for more strategic discussions. And I think ultimately, it comes, you know, the board has two functions, right? It has, a, it has the function to steer, which is the strategic, forward-looking, you know, wh where are we going and what are the big kind of calls we need to make to help us get there. 
And then there's a supervising role, which is, okay, we've, we've agreed that. Do we, are we seeking, you know, do we have assurance that that plan is being, being implemented and that we're working and behaving in the right way to deliver that, to retain our license to operate and, and to deliver those plans? And I think the innovation conversation obviously sits in both. You know, innovation is a, is a part of that forward-looking conversation. You know, what, what are the innovations that we think we need to, do, to, to engage in to help us deliver our long-term plans? But also here and now, day to day, month to month, how, how are we delivering against those? Are we, are we seeing results from them? Is that investment, is that investment yielding results? Um, so I, I, I think what we would certainly recommend is that boards take the time to step back and ask themselves which questions they need to be asking, what they need to think about, what they need to talk about in each of those areas across strategy, performance and governance, and make sure you, you're giving those appropriate weight in your, in your calendar and making sure that the the supervisory conversations don't drown out those, those, those more steering conversations. And likewise, strategy doesn't drown out performance, doesn't drown out governance. There's a kind of there's, there's, a, there's a balance that is right for your business at that at the point in its cycle that it that it sits in. Yes. Now both um, Henry and Faisal touch on what I think are, are policy issues relating um, to governance. And you know, Henry um, makes the point that in the recent autumn statements, um, the government severely cut back on the size of SME R&D tax credits, which perhaps isn't the most obvious thing uh, to do if you, if you are a government that is going to be entirely focused on, on innovation. And Faisal, you know, really is making the point that isn't, in a way, isn't innovation the key question which is facing uh, the UK economy? Because the, the, the problem that the UK economy has is, is weak productivity growth. Um, and ultimately, um, what is driving that? It, it's it's a lack. I, I would certainly argue, uh, but Jason, I wonder if you you agree that that reflects a lack of innovation in the UK economy and UK business relative some other relative to some other major economies. I say if you do what you've always done, you get what you've always got. So um, I saw uh, Farida had put in the comments as well that you know it's a nice to have, not a must have. I think those that think it's a nice to have may not be on the high street in three to five years' time. So uh, definitely is as a must have. Uh, there are a number of challenges that are facing. That's probably the biggest one um, is, is staffing, um, and then uh, driven partly by you know the amount of uh, immigration, about of the limiting pool to many businesses, particularly in retail, on finding people to work for. So therefore, in terms of the innovation, you have to be innovative in terms of what you can do to uh, keep those people and, and to attract those people. And it can't just be salary. So it has to be thinking way out in terms of new ways and, and that will give them flexibility, uh, a great work-life balance and, and, some, and, and some innovation to ensure that they stay. So that workforce is really important to be, because that, that is a key driver of it. And then to approach that and to ensure it as part of the board, to, one of the pieces on the list is how can the board members ensure that that becomes the, the innovation across the culture, but simply, the best part is, is reduce the ego, cut the ego out, just realize that everyone on the group has just has a different job. No one's more important than others. So therefore, you can get close to your teams that were hinting before, listening groups, morning breakfasts, and, and actually just involve more people. Then that it, culture becomes automatic. And the culture doesn't come from one person. It doesn't just come from the CEO. It comes from all of those leaders within the business. So again, shared vision, shared mission, shared vision, bringing everybody on that same journey will ensure that that culture will therefore thrive and be alive. Yes, and uh, I think you know you're absolutely right. Some uh, we should see innovation um, as being absolutely key to any business, and I think a lot of businesses like to claim, of course, that they are pursuing innovation. But you, I mean, we, we talk about greenwashing, but maybe there is a, there's something else called innovation washing, which is where um, a business claims to be pro-innovation, but but in reality, you know, when anything goes wrong, uh, when any money is lost, when a, when a project doesn't quite work, um, the, the business is actually quite intolerant of that of that kind of uh, outcome, um, which which really doesn't encourage innovation. Um, well, I the time the clock is ticking against us, and just for our remaining few minutes, uh, Patrick, I'd, I'd love to hand back over to you. And I wonder what your final reflections are in terms of what has been said and what what this report has achieved. Well, thank you very much, Roger. And I, I feel bad that we're not getting to all the questions which are uh, coming in on the Q and A. Um, I'm sure we can respond to them uh, after this uh, this is over, uh, after the, the the webinar is over. 
Um, look, I think we've covered an enormous amount of ground. This is, as someone pointed out, a very complex subject. There are lots and lots of pieces that interact in the jigsaw. There's no, obviously, no one thing you can do to become more innovative. Um, uh, but I, I think the report ha has very successfully mapped those issues um, and, and has given us some insights into what those issues are and what to do about them. Um, I thought the point that companies mature and the governance needs to mature, I think that's very well made, that a small company's needs are to be too, arguably small companies have too little governance, arguably very big companies end up with too much governance. But getting that balance right with respect to innovation as time goes on, I think that's a well made point. Uh, and the question that was asked about metrics, making sure that the metrics don't stifle innovation uh, and indeed encourage innovation, the right sort of innovation, of course, you want innovation that impacts the bottom line. Um, so I thought those came forward for me. Um, I thought the point about um, really the understanding of innovation and the importance of innovation at board level and indeed right through the company, senior team, uh, the, the, the broader workforce, uh, and indeed the culture, uh, which we always find very hard to measure, um, but, but the point that uh, everyone needs to line up behind innovation if it's going to happen, I think that's very well made and, and be prepared to fail. Um, not all innovation works, not all risks come off, um, not all ideas to, to, to be good ones or, or turn out to be ideas that you can scale up. So you have to be prepared for failure and how you deal with that. Um, and, and I think we had some, some great examples of experiences of innovation and the impact of, uh, of, of government policy, um, the uh, distinction and link between strategy and innovation. Uh, you know, I think there's, there are lots and lots of uh, aspects to this that uh, we've managed to cover. And, and I think um, it's only an hour. I think uh, we've covered a, a broad and complex subject uh, uh, it, it, and, and brought some insight to it. So I, I would like to thank um, the Centre for Corporate Governance and uh, the Advisory Board for the steer they've given on this. I'd like to thank Chris for the work he's done on this. Um, and I'd like to thank our analysts, um, Jason, Megan, and Stilpon, um, for uh, devoting your time and energy to this. It's been fantastic. And uh, uh, I think uh, I'd like to wish everyone some uh, good, good, good reading of the report and good luck with innovating. Um, hopefully we've brought a little bit of light into this very complex subject. So thank you very much. And I think we are about a minute ahead of schedule. So uh, well, done, well done everyone for keeping us to time. Thank you, Roger. Thank you very much, Patrick.